Viking fans rally to save their team, a late game stadium proposal is unveiled, and a show of solidarity in healthcare. Details in Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. Lawmakers have missed their self-imposed deadline to adjourn Sine Die on Monday, April 30th, and the ensuing week was filled with twists, turns, and some collaboration. Governor and lawmakers stood side by side in a show of solidarity. A bill signing for Health and Human Services restores $18 million in funding that was cut last session as part of the Global Budget Agreement. The bill reflects an agreeable solution to what is sometimes a contentious issue. And it's just a really an extraordinary accomplishment, especially in the context of some of the other difficulties we've had this session, working together in a cooperative, bipartisan way. This, this was cooperative and this was bipartisan all the way. Last year we did the health care side and actually pushed the costs below the previous a number that we spent and some excellent reforms about quality and quality, uh, quality and, and, um, and cost while preserving access, which is really hard to do. And this year in the, in the disability services side, we began some reforms in, the, uh, in the, the group homes and in those that are gonna make a huge difference in the future. And that's a lot. Chair of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, Senator David Hand, joined the governor at that bill signing earlier in the week. He joins me now to talk a little bit about it and about his health care compact idea. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Good to be here. Let's talk first about this bill signing. And again, it restores $18 million in funding for personal care assistance, emergency medical assistance programs, among others. Now, who do you think benefits the most from this legislation? Well, I think uh, there are a number of uh, people that benefit. There are a lot of small uh, issues that are covered in that bill that are doing some things. Some of them are reform oriented. We've got some things that are trying to pilot new approaches to doing uh, uh, nursing home care and so forth. But the biggest issue and the strongest reason that we had to try to put this bill together was to deal with a rate cut that was in the last bill that was contingent upon a federal waiver showing up and that federal waiver uh, hasn't shown up yet and so there was a, uh, a group of uh, care providers that were faced with about a 1.67 percent rate reduction. Uh, we felt that that was not uh, doable to let that happen so we really wanted to have a bill that would address that and that was one of the key components of what we did in addition to the things that you mentioned. Let's talk a little more broadly. In a release by the governor's office about that bill signing, it stated, quote, that it reflects a remarkable example of bipartisan negotiations on the part of the legislature and the administration. So, Senator, given areas of contention in health care between the two entities, what kind of message do you think it sends to Minnesotans that you were able to work together and collaborate on this? Well, I, my own belief is that we work together and agree on more things than we disagree. There clearly are some pretty high profile things that people differ on. but. Most of the work that we try to do in the legislature for the benefit of the people of the state, there is a lot of bipartisan effort to get these things done. In the health and human services area, there are a lot of things that people don't have ideological differences on. It's really a question of what can we afford to do and what is the best way to use the money uh, in a way that is accountable to the public. So when you start with that premise where you don't have ideological differences about the need to try to help people who need assistance, it really comes down to more of the practical questions of how do you solve those problems. This year, because we did not have a budget issue to deal with. We weren't trying to figure out a big global budget, but we're really trying to address some very specific problems. And we had very limited resources available to us. Uh, I think there was an agreement on the ground rules going in, and it led to some very productive work. And we all tried to focus on what were the high priorities. And I think that happened. I'm going to switch over to what you mentioned as a high pro profile ideological difference. You led a successful effort in the Senate, and eventually it passed in both the House and Senate, asking Congress essentially for permission to establish a health care compact. And you've been saying that this compact is important. Why do you think it is? Well, I think what it does is it sets the uh, expectation or lays out the uh, goal of, of restoring to states the authority to make decisions about health care dollars. That's the way that uh, historically we've operated in this country. It's only been in the relatively recent few decades maybe that we've seen this erosion or this transfer of power to the federal government in decision making on health care. I don't believe that that experiment has been very productive and just the whole way that we have to deal with Medicaid and the seeking waivers and trying to get permission to do things that we as a state think are right is evidence of that. So what the compact does is, is say that once the Congress approves, and they would have to approve, then the federal dollars that are being spent through the 
the federal laws would be returned to the state to be spent under state law. And so it really returns the authority of state government to make decisions on health care dollars. And that's really where it should be, and I think it's more accountable to the public that way. The governor did veto the bill. Yes, he did. There was a write-up in the New York Times about the issue, and it quoted Kate Johansson. She's the manager of health policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And here's that quote. This is a very toxic atmosphere between Republican legislators and the Dayton administration on this issue. Senator, in your opinion, have these philosophical differences essentially become toxic? Well, I think in some ways they have. And, and uh, I think what she was commenting on was really uh, had to do with the health care exchange. And there's been some uh, other uh, wrangling about that issue. But, but really what it comes down to is whether or not we believe that the federal government ought to be the major player in decision making on health care or whether the states ought to be the major player. And we believe that it makes more sense. It's more fiscally responsible and it's more responsive to the needs of citizens if you have decisions made by a state legislature. Uh, I think clearly, given what the governor's actions were in vetoing our health care compact bill, he doesn't share that belief. I think he has a high degree of confidence in the federal government being able to do this. The health care exchange is another one of the federal ideas that is being asked to, that we should be compelled to adopt, and there are many of us who don't believe that that makes any sense, that we ought to have ownership here in Minnesota about how we are going to uh, manage health care and health insurance. And I think that is uh, the ideological, if you will, or the philosophical divide that exists between the governor and where we are. And so given that, do you think there's any room for compromise with either your, yourself or and those who follow your line of thinking on this issue and the governor's office? Well, I think so. And I, I really believe that the results of the Supreme Court case that's going to come forward uh, sometime this summer will be helpful. I believe that the Supreme Court will overturn uh, at least major portions of the federal ACA and as a result of that I think it will reset the stage to ask the question again where should decisions about health care be made uh, and I believe that as this issue becomes more broadly known that the public is going to weigh in on this and I can't believe that they will say we would rather have policy decisions made in Washington than in Minnesota. Uh, it, just on the face of it, if you make a decision in Minnesota and it turns out not to work so well, you can change it. Now it's always hard to get the legislature to change, but if you make that decision in Washington and you need to have the federal Congress change, that's a very, very difficult uh, threshold to meet. So as a practical matter, we ought to be trying to focus more decision making at the state level than at the federal level. And I think that as people become aware of this, I think we'll have the support of the public. Senator, the Times also stated that Minnesota is essentially a case study of the politics found in state capitals around the country as officials grapple with this health care insurance exchange idea. Do you think we have entered uncharted territory at this point? Well, not really uncharted, but it's, uh, if you read American history, there have been a number of cases where there's been this uh, tension and debate about what is the role of the federal government, what is the role of state government. And I think this is one of those times where we're being asked to think about this in a, in a way that maybe we haven't. Uh, and it's a good thing to think about, and it's a good debate to have. Uh, it really calls into question whether the federal structure that was enacted uh, by our founding fathers is legitimate, is workable, and is still applicable to today, or whether it isn't. I believe it is. I believe there's great merit in that, and I think that, that uh, we need to continue to make the point that this is the way to restore that, that balance of power, is to make sure that states have the power and the ability to make decisions, and that there are some things, even if they may be good things, are simply not in the province of the federal government to decide. And health care is one of those things. Very personal issue, very costly issue, a lot of differences of opinion. It makes more sense to allow states to have the say in how to do that and give them an opportunity to experiment. And, and through that, I think you'll end up with better decisions and a better system overall. Okay, Senator David Hand, thank you for your time on this issue. We appreciate it as always. Thank you for letting me be here. After hearings in the House and Senate and bills ready to be taken up by their respective bodies, a new twist surfaced in the ongoing Viking Stadium saga. Republican leaders came to the table with a different way to fund a stadium, paying for the infrastructure using the bonding bill as its funding mechanism. Uh, what we have done is had a major shift uh, from looking at it as, uh, as a broad stadium discussion to one of uh, infrastructure uh, and moving to this as a piece of a broad infrastructure plan across the state. It looks very specifically at the costs of the stadium project that relate to infrastructure and uh, paying for that within the bonding bill potentially of a statewide uh, capital investment plan focusing on infrastructure. Yesterday was 
probably the most cynical attempt at political gamesmanship that I've ever seen in my 35 years around here. Legislative leaders are supposed to be doing that, providing leadership, not gamesmanship. And instead, Republican leaders are playing poker with thousands of Minnesota jobs that are at stake in these outcomes while they're trying to just save their own. When we began working with MMB, uh, it became clear that there was some hurdles within that uh, particular arrangement about using general obligation bonds uh, that might make it uh, difficult for both the city and for uh, the Vikings in terms of their current agreement to move forward with this. Uh, because, of those, uh, because of those impediments, uh, and we said that we would, we would only move forward with a bill that we could get support from all parties with, uh, that we will not be bringing that forward as a bonding proposal. Senator John Marty sits on the Health and Human Services Committee. He's here to discuss the health care compact idea and much more. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Senator, the health care compact bill, it was passed and ultimately vetoed by the governor. You didn't vote for the bill on the Senate floor. Why? Well, I, I have real concerns that we're taking Minnesota laws and we're watering them down to what other states have in terms of what kind of coverage people get. There's so many scams in terms of health insurance in other states. We haven't had that same issue. We've had problems, but not that kind of problem. And then number two, um, saying, well, the federal government will give us a fixed amount of money, and then we've got to deal with it. Well, frankly, the health care costs have been going so much faster than inflation. I think it would shortchange the state. And basically what they're doing is in everyone for themselves, health insurance. You go out and buy health insurance, and we're going to just give you more options of insurance to buy. And I, I'm not interested in that. I think we should be providing health care to people, not health insurance. Ultimately, though, a health care exchange will likely be implemented. Obviously, that, that's still Probably, fluid. Probably, yes. I think right. it's almost certain it so would be, So working yes. under that assumption, mm -hmm. would you prefer the state craft its own exchange? Absolutely. I think that's one of the interesting things. Even the New York Times and everybody beginning to pay attention to the fact that Minnesota's got such a weird dynamic here where the Republicans in the legislature don't want to pull together a health insurance exchange because they argue, oh, it's related to Obamacare and they hate Obamacare. Well, I mean, the fact that former Governor Pawlenty had proposed an insurance exchange even before Obamacare came into being. It's, it's interesting dynamics there. The Chamber of Commerce, a lot of the Republican-backed groups strongly support the state organizing its own exchange, not having the federal one. And so it's a, it's a weird politics where the Republicans who generally favor that are opposing it, and Democrats who are differing places on the issue are supporting it, having the state do its own rather than the federal one. You just referenced a New York Times story, and I would like to chat a little bit more about that. Sure. As you said, it was pointing to Minnesota and the unusual dynamics right now surrounding this health care exchange versus the compact. Kate Johansson, she's the manager of health policy with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, was quoted in that article saying, there's a very toxic atmosphere between Republican legislators and the Dayton administration on this issue. Do you think the philosophical differences have indeed become toxic? I, I think they're, they may be toxic differences. I'm not sure they're necessarily philosophical. I think it's partly, it's more political, I think. Um, it's anything that sounds like it could be attacked as Obamacare has got to be bad, whether they like it or not philosophically. So I'm not sure it's a philosophical difference as much as a political one. They don't want to give any credence to anything that has any ties to what they call Obamacare. And yet toxic is a very strong word. Would you agree it's gotten yes, to that it's, stage? Yes, it's getting to the point where who knows? I mean, the governor feels he's got the authority to move ahead and basically the federal government is forcing the states to either move ahead or we'll do it for you. And so the governor's planning to move ahead, it sounds like, and the legislature um, is torn because a lot of them don't want the federal government to do it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly not a healthy relationship. Maybe it's not toxic, but it's certainly not a healthy one. Going back to the compact idea, Senator Han contends that it, gives the it would give the states the right to make decisions on health care. Now, you yourself are a supporter of a single-payer health care system. So given that, 
Why wouldn't you support the idea of letting states remain in control of their health care dollars? Well, I very much think states should be able to be in control of their dollars. This compact, though, is kind of we're going to work with these other states and have insurance sales across state. I think you're going to get more insurance scams, more problems with that. What I want to do is, is I want states to deal with health care, not health insurance. So that's my objection to their proposal. But bottom line is I do think that states are the laboratories that ought to be figuring out the best way to deal with health care. And I think I, my proposal, our Minnesota health plan, would do that. I think it would cover everyone. It would save money. Um, recognize that our country has been a failure in terms of providing health care access to people. Got some of the best doctors, hospitals, clinics but the worst access to health care in any of the developed countries. And yet one of the highest rates of insured people in the country. Right, right. With not, oh, Minnesota, about, Minnesota right. is one of, we're maybe second highest in number of people who are insured right now. But again, even so, there are people who, who we got 22,000 emergency room visits for dental care. I mean, why? Because people can't access the care, including, and I think dental care is part of health care. And, and to me, Minnesota is less bad than other states in terms of how we dealt with it, but um, I think it should be a state-by-state -state thing within the federal framework right now, but I think states should be able to go further and deliver health care instead of health insurance. Senator, I want to go back to this New York Times article because it did state that Minnesota is essentially a case study right now of the politics that are found in state capitals around the country as officials grapple with the health insurance exchange idea. Do you think the eyes of the nation are focused on Minnesota right now? Um, they are paying attention to Minnesota partly because of this. We're, we're playing out here what's being talked about in lots of other states because we have the divided government with the DFL governor and Republican legislature. Um, and the, what they called toxic relationship based on, I'd say, the politics. The Republicans hate Obamacare, whether they know what it is or not, or whether they want parts of it or not, and because of that, they're going to oppose it. So I think other states are trying to figure out, is Minnesota going to try and do its own thing, because Minnesota's tended to be a leader? Are we going to try and do our own thing or wait for the feds to do, impose their federal one on us? And I think everybody's watching that, yeah. Senator, my last question for you is, do you think, to use your words, that the, the politics of this issue has polarized the legislature and perhaps the country? Yes, very much so. I think if we, what I'd love to see us do in health care is start, step, take a step back and figure out if we want everyone to have access to health care and comprehensive health care, including dental and mental health and so on. Let's start with what our goal is and work back from there. Instead, it's um, Obamacare, or, or as Tim Pawlenty rightly pointed out when he was running for president, Obamany care. I mean, it was Mitt Romney. I mean, the two presidential candidates were the sort of the key players in designing this sort of system, and and that doesn't make it a good system. And I think there are lots of problems with it. But um, it's the politics. You know, one side's attacking is is Obamacare, and others are pointing out saying, "Hey, wait, that was a Republican idea." So it's a weird politics. It's more politics than philosophy, if you ask me. Okay, well, on those words, thank you for joining us, Senator Marty. Always appreciate your time. My pleasure. With the stadium issue undecided, purple and gold continue to permeate areas of the Capitol, inside and out. Well, just who are these fans? Well, they come from near and far, by foot and by car, with a resounding message. I come in Friday, I drive home Monday. So you can just think of what my hotel costs, my gas costs, my food costs, my entertainment costs. Because when I come here, I'm not just coming for the Vikings, I'm here for the entire weekend. I come here for everything. I've got baseball games, basketball games, the Renaissance festivals, uh, concerts, you know. We're here for the we're, draft today. We're, yeah. Draft party, like, you know, like it, it just goes on and on what we spend our money for. And it's not just me. In Canada alone, we have over 2,000 people that come to every single Viking game. You know, I joke with my boss. You know, they ask me where I'm going on vacation. I usually tell them I'm going out east, St. Paul. Um, I, it brought me back together with my dad that I didn't see for five years. You know, Viking football is a lot deeper than just the three-hour game. I, 
you know, the Twins go through the World Series. I, I don't, you know, everyone sees when the teams are going good, just the, the whole community civic pride feeling. I just, I, it, to me, it's just so goose bumpy when I'm downtown and I see fathers and sons come to the game and just the, an excuse to get together for a half a year. It's, you know, Viking football is kind of like the state's campfire, as it's been mentioned before. More than a dozen senators will step down at the end of this legislative session. Senate Finance Chair Claire Roebling is a part of that group. She gives us the inside perspective on her time in office. Senator, you have been a part of the Minnesota Senate now for 16 years. Much of that time was spent in the minority. You are now a key part of the majority, including your role as chair of the Finance Committee. We'll get into that in just a moment. But first, I want to ask you, why step down now? Well, last time I ran, I thought this is going to be my last term. And then when we came into the majority and I was given a lot of key responsibilities and, and then later on a leadership role, I thought, well, maybe I should stay here and continue working for a while. But I, the, the thought that I was going to retire after 16 years kept hanging over me and I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue. And then I got the perfect district and I thought, oh, I, I love these people. I would love to continue to represent them. And so I announced that I was going to run again. But then I was getting ready for the endorsing convention and I started pulling out some signs out of our barn and they're covered with hay dust, of course, and looking at the big stack going, I'm gonna have to clean these all up and put them all out. And then I thought, I don't wanna do this anymore. And it isn't just the campaigning, but everything else that goes with it, the time away from your family, the you know, it, just the acrimony that we have here all the time, it's stressful, um, tiring, exhausting when we're in session, sometimes very exciting too, and sometimes very rewarding. But I'm just wearing down, and I thought it's time to let somebody else do it. You are the first female chair of the powerful Senate Finance Committee. What were your expectations when you took the gavel and, and kind of your, um, your feeling about it as well? Well, coming into the majority last year with a $5.2 billion deficit was an overwhelming task. And it, it was a struggle. We worked very, very hard trying to get our, our funding into the resources that we had. I mean, so our spending into the resources that we had. And we simply didn't have enough resources because of the recession in order to fund everything that everybody wanted. So obviously we had to make some very difficult cuts, some very difficult decisions. And one of the best things that came out of it, of course, is we've taken that $5.2 billion deficit and turned it into almost a billion dollar surplus. And so I'm proud of that work. I'm proud that we are where we are and I can leave the state position and say, we've accomplished something very significant here. As far as being the first female chair, though, did you think that more eyes would be, or eyes would be watching you a bit more closely, or was that not even a thought that had entered your head? I didn't really think about that. I have always um, just moved into positions. I haven't thought I'm moving, I'm moving into them because I'm a female. Uh, I, I would expect people to review my work the same as they would anyone else's. Uh, so on to, to add to that then, how do you think you grew into the role from when you first took the gavel until now? It was a little intimidating at first, and now I feel very comfortable. I thought about that the other day when I was sitting there chairing the committee when we had the stadium bill up, and I, I just feel very relaxed now. At first I was very attentive, rather nervous, you know, who do I call on next? The hands are being raised left and right. Um, witnesses are at the testifying table and trying to remember their names so you could call on them appropriately, trying to keep the committee on schedule. But now it's, it's much more relaxed for me. And I love committee work. That has always been my favorite part of the legislature is the committee work, where you really break down what's in the bills, where you really get an opportunity to talk to the experts and find out information. And, and I've always been the one asking lots of questions. And it's probably partly my journalism background. 
but I always had questions for the testifiers and really trying to find out what this bill is going to do for the state of Minnesota. And that's what we're here to do. That's not the glamorous work, but it is the absolute necessary work for the legislature. So Senator, as you look back, what are you most proud of at this time? Well, I, I'm proud of the relationships I've built and how that helps me in the work that I do. Because I truly believe that politics is a lot about relationships and you cannot you cannot accomplish your goals if you can't get other people to work with you. And one of the things I fear about what I'm seeing here at the Capitol these days is that relationships are breaking down and people are not getting along and it shows in the lack of progress we make in our work. And I, I feel badly about that. I think we need to take more time, spend more time together, even on a social level perhaps, and not just a work level, because we have to trust each other more. There's a lack of trust. So what would your advice be then to incoming legislators in that it specifically related to trying to build those relationships and maintain relationships? Well, don't hang around with just the people who think like you. You have to, you have to branch out. I was somewhat fortunate and it, it maybe it was an unusual circumstances. When I came into the legislature after the 1996 election, I was the only new Republican and there were eight new Democrats. So I had no freshman class in my caucus. So I, I, I reached out to the other freshmen and that was my first exposure. We had orientation. We spent a couple days together with that and I got to be good friends with them. Right now there's only three of us left from that class. It's Senator Higgins, Senator Weger, and myself. And Senator Higgins and I are both retiring now so it's only Senator Weger that may be left. But um, I always had to reach out to get anything done as a member of the minority. So I worked on relationships. Even now with the governor, although I, you know, I've gotten several bills vetoed, I, I've at least been able to go in there and talk to him about it, reaching out in a, in a not highly confrontational way to try and bring some resolve to some of the issues that we've been working on. Unfortunately, they're not always successful. We have some major philosophical differences, but you know, as a person, I can get along with him. Senator, I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak to your constituents now. What would you like to say to them? Well, thank you for the honor of letting me represent you. Um, truly, it is an honor. It's, it's something that most people in the state will never have the opportunity to do. And I hope I've served you well. I, um, I have worked hard, tried to keep my, my values and principles, and it just I truly respect my constituents and I love the community that I live in and um, and I I'm going to miss it in many ways and in other ways it is truly time to let someone else do the job. Senator Claire Roebling good luck to you in the future and thank you for joining us we appreciate it. Thank you Julie. This concludes this week's program from all of us at House Public Information and Senate Media Services. I'm Julie Bartke. Thank you for watching Capitol Report. Mm -hmm.